everybody. Welcome to New York City DSA Political Education. Um, happy to um, have you all here tonight and very excited to welcome Steve Frazier. Steve Frazier is not the Greco-Roman wrestler whom Google <laughs> turns up when searching his name. This Steve That's Fra a lie. I am the Greco-Roman wrestler. <laughs> This Steve Frazier is a historian, writer, and editor who's been analyzing about American capitalism and its class structures for decades. And by class structure, I mean both working and ruling. I've personally found the book he co-edited, Ruling America, very useful in my understanding of our rotten elites. Among his other books are a bio of Sidney Hillman, whom we'll hear about tonight, I don't know if that's true. That's true. Every Man, a Speculator, a History of Wall Street's Role in American Life, and the Age of Acqu Acquiescence, the Life and Death of American Resistance to Organized Wealth and Power. Um, so Steve, you know, as we see, has a great uh, resume, and he is so graciously offered to join us tonight and um, present. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, yeah, we'll have announcements at the end. Right, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. I recognize some faces from the summer, so uh, welcome back, and I'm glad to see you uh, weren't so put off by what went on in the summer that you didn't come back. Um, so, um, I'm going to tell. Uh, a pretty, uh, you all know this story, even if you don't know the details of this particular period, which is, in case you don't know what the period is, we're going to talk about the turn of the 20th century and sort of the golden age of socialism in, in the United States and in New York, because this is, of course, about New York. So I'm going to tell uh, a story which we're all familiar with because we tell it to each other and we tell it in our publications, I think. And, and we think this way. Um, and that is that uh, workers facing uh, very uh, difficult, abusive uh, conditions on the job uh, struggle to resist. Uh, if uh, the circumstances are right, they are able to organize unions. Unions are uh, vital for defending the interests of working people, and we think they are a stepping stone because of the experience of being in a union, of collective behavior, of solidarity, and so on, a stepping stone to the, uh, to the anti-capitalist socialist society we always have in our sights and is what we're in this room all about. And that, that has kind of always been the kind of a certain narrative and analytical logic that uh, leftist socialists and others have uh, subscribed to. Um, um, obviously, that's very abstract, and you, you could debate it out in a lot of different ways, and and uh, and so on. But the the main point is, no unionism, no socialism. So I'm going to tell the opposite story because that's what I really think this period is about. And I'm being a little provocative deliberately, but I, I believe that. Now, uh, I'm going to start. I told uh, Carrington that I would come as a human slide. And s since there are no slides, thank God I did come as a human slide. I'm a man of my word. So I'm going to get undressed for a minute. show you a shirt that my daughter actually made for me. So I don't know if you can see it. This shirt, this front of this shirt, is a picture of a picket line we've seen a thousand times. This one was a hundred, and about a hundred years ago. It's the amalgamated clothing workers uh, on strike, picketing, carrying signs saying solidarity, the union, we need a union. Etc. You can't read the signs. It's a typical sign that we've seen. We see today. The clothing is a little different. On the back of this shirt, it says this. Can you read that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Labor will rule. Now this is an audiovisual uh, slide, so I'm going to read you some quotes. Um, 
The first one uh, comes uh, that labor rule is a piece of. And the uh, full quote is, one can hear the footsteps of the deliverer, labor will rule, and the world will be free. That's a letter from a letter that Sidney Hillman, who I, I, I assume many of you know, but I'll just say he was one of the founders of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America. We're going to be talking about the needle trades uprising in New York City around the turn of the century. So he's a very relevant figure. He wrote this to his infant daughter, Philoene, in 1918. Then I'm going to read you three other quotes that are kind of redundant, but I really want to drive this point home. The first, the ultimate aim of the labor movement is to bring the working class into its own, to transform it from a working class within a capitalist society into a free and democratic industrial republic. That was said by Joseph Schlossberg, giving the keynote address at the founding of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America in 1914. The next one says this, the time has come for the organization of a union of clothing workers that will become an integral part of the revolutionary army that will emancipate the working class. This mission is ours. That's a, a report by the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Executive Board at its founding convention in 1914. Finally, the industrial and inter-industrial organization built upon the solid rock of class knowledge and class consciousness will put the organized working class in actual control of production and the working class will then be ready to take possession of it. That is in the constitution of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers in 1913. There's no union, that's a union, it's not the Socialist Party, right? It's not a radical, it is a radical, it's a union that is already engaged in conventional, in many respects, collective bargaining with its employers. But it doesn't conceive of itself right from the get-go in those terms exclusively, but simultaneously as a movement that will eventually result in labor will rule. No union we know of today would promulgate such a constitution. At least I don't know of in, I don't know of any. And so what I'm going to argue here, I'm not arguing. I'm arguing. I'm, here's the argument. It's not. Uh, it's not no union, no socialism. It's no socialism, no union. And then. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how and why that was the case. Uh, when the needle trades rise up, both in the ladies' garment workers and among the men's garment workers' unions in the period roughly from 1909 to 1913, we're talking about mass strikes in New York City of 40 and 50 and 60,000 people, more than the 20,000. I don't know if you read Annalise Orlick's essay, but a lot of people. It's a big mass strike. Um, that, is the, that is the inheritance of a broad, in New York City, and elsewhere, anti-capitalist culture, which had been maturing for decades during the Gilded Age. Um, I know I'm not going to be able to talk about that, but I'm going to give you some of it because we don't have time for that, and I think maybe somewhere else in this course's syllabus, this working class upsurge of uh, the late 19th century will be talked about. I don't know. I'm going to just give you some of the highlights, though. There's the Tompkins Square uh, riot, of 1874, which happens amidst the Great Depression that began the year before and is met with massive police violence by the city of New York and is in part organized by members of the First International, by German socialists living in New, in New York. Um, there is then, uh, so just highlights here, I'm not going to talk about them. There is then the Knights of Labor, which establishes District 49 in New York City. That's one of the more radical uh, 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 Knights of Labor assemblies. 
so radical that it becomes infamous, not infamous, it, 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 it creates a stir when it demands that at the Knights of Labor Convention in Virginia, a black delegate be uh, uh, commissioned to introduce Terence Powderly, the head of the Knights of Labor, and Virginia has a, uh, the Virginia governor goes crazy, and uh, anyway, that's not the point. The point is a radical assembly, <laughs> it's a radical assembly here in New York, District 49. There's the railroad strike of 1877, great mass strike all across the country. It doesn't impact directly in New York, but it does in Schenectady and Buffalo and Rochester, where there are uh, 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 mass uh, uh, gatherings that uh, uh, um, tear up tracks, burn railroad cars, etc. It was in the nature of that mass strike in that year to do that. Then there is, some of you may have heard this, the Henry George campaign for mayor in 1896, 1886. Henry George, the author of Progress and Poverty, which some of you may know, runs for mayor on the United Labor ticket. And that coalition includes everybody. The organized, to the degree there was one, organized labor movement, uh, various socialists, radical Catholics, the Irish Land League, the Knights of Labor, are all combined in this anti-capitalist Henry George mayoral campaign and he comes in second, and he beats by a considerable margin Teddy Roosevelt, who ran for mayor in that same year. He loses to the Tammany Hall hack. Um, so these are, and then what you have developing in New York City is what uh, you have uh, not only these, uh, what, what used to be called hobohemias. These are what Gramsci would have called organic intellectuals of the working class who are either anarchist inclined, syndicalist inclined, uh, voracious readers, organizers of clubs and discussion groups. It's a thriving kind of uh, literary and political culture in the city. Um, all of this, one might argue, if I had more time I would do so, but I won't, uh, is, a, is a reaction to the shock of the new, of capitalism really digging in and disturbing all kinds of relationships uh, in, in what had been a pre-capitalist or petty commodity producing society. And it produces this enormous resistance to the ravages of capitalism. And that anti-capitalist culture is, is, it, it greets the needle trades workers when it's, they're part of it, they're immersed in it, they're saturated in it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the needle trades uprisings. First of all, it's the second largest industry in New York at that time. It's vital to the city's economy. Um, it's it's, it's, it's uh, notorious for its sweatshops, rightly so, because it practices among the more abusive, tyrannical forms of exploitation and oppression uh, that capitalism is capable of, of uh, providing. Uh, it, uh, it's full of, it's a, 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 an industry uh, prone to enormous rates of accidents, injuries, tuberculosis, uh, various other kinds of diseases, um, sexual harassment, nepotism, uh, various kinds of, you know, the, you know, in the subways, they used to have that sign, it said, if you don't come in Sunday, don't come in Monday. That was addressed to garment workers and others, meaning it was a seven day, we're talking about 70, 80 hour work weeks. Um, uh, this is what the garment industry presents, and yet it has its modern sector too. It's a, it's a kind of story of combined and uneven development. These sweatshop contractors service the larger manufacturers like Triangle. Triangle's a modern factory uh, that relies on, anyway, they don't need to know that. Um, and in this world, uh, there are various, in this world of, the, of this working class, which is heavily Jewish, but not entirely, there are various kinds of radicalisms and atavisms. Trotsky once said, some, this is a paraphrase, uh, that history and historical revolutions 
are an amalgam of, uh, of um, I don't know if he said this, atavisms and the, and the modern, uh, the ancient, the archaic, that's what he said, the archaic and the modern. So you, I, I don't know if you read that Annalise Orlick article, maybe some of you did, but this Jewish socialism is, is heavily inflected by a religious consciousness. The oath that they take to stand with each other is a, is, originates in, 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 a, in, a, in a religious context. Um, they uh, are also, however, heirs to revolutionary upheavals in Russia. Many of the founders and initial organizers of the needle trades, both in the ILG and the amalgamated, are refugees from the 1905 revolution in Russia. Hillman is. Uh, various other people are. Uh, the Bund, which uh, is, is, the, is the socialist organization allied with the Russian socialist movement in Russia, it, and many Bundists escape that and come here. The Bund is very active here. Many of them work in the industry, in the garment industry. So the industry is infused with this. Come, I took, I'm going on too long, right? Yeah, I saw you watching that. I, I, I don't know if we're doing it like in the summer where people can stop me or you don't want me to do that. Or, I'm just trying to see if there's uh, messages from the Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm nervous. Um, it, these are what are called, they are also kind of organic intellectuals, a little less organic, they're semi-organic. They're called half intellectuals. Hillman was a half intellectual. A lot of them had been training in yeshivas. He was going to be a rabbi, and then the revolution happened. He forgot that, uh, to do that. He wasn't going to do that. And a lot of them are like that. They kind of try to get higher education. They're very well read. They read a lot in prison. They all end up in prison in, in 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 uh, in 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 in, uh, in Tsarist Russia, and um, so so that's it. But um, so there's this there's this religious consciousness. There's a consciousness of filial loyalty, of tribal loyalty. Uh, that's what Trotsky, I think, means by the archaic blending with the modern. And they're not. And Jewish socialism. If you read the end, a lot of these, okay. So they're very active in, in, in the Union. So too are other uh, strands of radicalism. The syndicalists are heavily represented in the garment industry. Anarchists are heavily represented in the garment industry. Some of them are Jewish, some of them are Italian. The Italians begin to enter the industry a little later than, than the Jews do, but they, are, they become a very significant part. They behave differently than the Jews, but there are both Italian socialists who become extremely important in organizing their paisani because there are those kinds of loyalties, that is, parochial loyalties to village. They have to, okay, I forgot, I'm getting lost. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, Italian anarchists, I'll tell you a story. Uh, and th this is, these are not ideologues. These are working people. Who, uh, some of them are half intellectual. Some are working people at, for whom these ideologies are in their workaday blood. And I'll tell you a little story. I wrote a book about Sidney Hillman. And to do it, I interviewed a lot of retired uh, garment workers. And some of them were down in Miami and kind of sad in a way in, in kind of SROs in in Miami Beach. I, anyway, and some of them had good memories, some of them didn't, they were old. And uh, I spoke to one guy, and he had a terrible memory, couldn't remember who his family was and stuff like that, he's by himself. He had escaped, he knew that he had escaped getting drafted into the Tsar's army, which a lot of uh, Jews wanted to do, my grandfather did. Um, uh, and then he got here, and he's an anarchist. He was already an anarchist in Russia. And he told me in great detail the story. He was an arsonist because anarchists believed, some of them, in, if, in burning down the premises of a recalcitrant employer. And he told me in great detail the story. So he's just an ordinary guy, but very immersed in the, his, 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 his anarchism. There are also in the industry pockets of very self-confident, how shall I put this? Oh no, I should tell you one other thing. 
Bef in, back in that prehistoric Gilded Age, before this is all happening, the garment industry was oh, in a state of chronic civil war. Strikes all the time. They would result in nothing. Maybe, maybe they'd get a, you know, the, the employer would agree to something and, and, he, and as soon as the strike was over, he'd, he'd, he'd forget it the next day. The reason I'm, I'm saying that is that among those who could exercise this kind of leverage were the most skilled garment workers, pressers, tailors, cutters. Uh, these are the, but they're very, these are called the red tailors. They, in other words, sometimes we think, oh, well, uh, craft, highly skilled, and therefore leveraged workers who can exercise power against the boss because of their skills are going to be conservative. Sometimes they indeed are. These people were not. Uh, and what they really valued, and some of you know labor history, well, was something they thought of as workers' control, of controlling the pace of work in, in their domains. And they and they are they are kind of you know, somebody's knocking on that door. Yeah, and it's, uh, oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Sorry. That's okay. Anyway, um, so so these worker control pockets in the industry among the most skilled workers are very militant, but also very unwilling to obey more general authority from the union command. So they, they're a recurrent problem. So are the more uh, parochial, even pietistic Italians and Jews who have loyalty to their rabbis, uh, uh, to the Lanzmannschaften that may be run by, by elders in the community. Um, so the union has to, that is building out of this ferment, this anti-capitalist ferment, needs to be able to orchestrate. It's hard, very hard to do this. It takes years, years to do this because there's also a kind of ethno-nationalism that runs. There are, they're in the industry. There's Bohemians, there's Russians, there's Poles, there's Lithuanians. All of them infected by nationalist feelings that have been cropping up in the Russian Empire for a long time. Now they're here, and those beliefs, which are informed by enlightenment ideology about freedom and democracy and national liberation are part of it, but they're also jealous. They guard their borders. They're, it's, it's an identity politics which has a real energy to it and contributes to the union, but can also be divisive inside the union. So this is the, uh, this is the uh, situation that, um, sorry, I'm out, what am I sorry for? Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Anyway, out of this is created the, uh, and in great opposition, so you have all these conflicting, <coughs> this is really distracting me now. Um, um, okay, you, you, you create this union out of this kind of radical, let's not call it socialist, there's so many radical strains going on, out of this radical ferment that gives it energy and vision and a sense, even while it's, it's, it's proposing quite practical demands, uh, you know, uh, that... Uh, Have somebody for me, I'm hungry. I've come to it's funny. Oh, yeah. Why not? How come I was spared this in the summer? I guess he was she warm. Started this yeah. um, oh. a few months ago. Anyway. Um, oh, and, and women, of course. Why am I, I so stupid of me? And Annalise Orlick's article is very good about this. This is the kind of uh, well, coming of age is a stupid phrase, but you understand what I'm saying. The awakening of women, the empowering of women, the critical role of women in organizing and leading these strikes. There's a famous saying in the in amalgamated circles, not the ILG, that, you know, Hillman, when he came to America, first went to Chicago, and he worked for Hart Shafter and Marx. He was a cutter, terrible, very bad at the job, but became, it's a very skilled job. I once tried to be a cutter. I had no idea what I was doing, but I, that was, I'll tell you, that's a good story, but I won't tell you that. His, there was a woman in, at Hart Shafter and Marx named Bessie Abramovitz. Bessie was a key organizer of the Hart Shafter and Marx workers. Years later, not many years later, she would. She, she, and, 
Anyway, okay, she, I, I'll finish this little story. Bessie, you know, Hillman became a big deal, and I'm going to talk about that, a very celebrated figure. But before that quite, no, when that began to happen, Bessie was heard to say, I was Bessie Abramovitz before he was Sidney Hillman, which means she really was a key figure. He wasn't. He became one at Hart Shaft and Marx. Anyway, the women. So you have this union forming out of this amalgam of radical and archaic tendencies, uh, workers' control, ethno-nationalism, and what you get is what I would call in New York City, that's the birthplace, the pre-CIO. Because what do you get? They organize this against fierce opposition. First of all, the opposition of the AFL. There is the, There was an AFL union which had the franchise that Gompers gave them. It's called the United Garment Workers Union. They didn't organize anybody. They organized overall workers in the kind of uh, Appalachian states, and that was it. They didn't believe in strikes. They believed only in the boycott as a way of it, and so on. Uh, but they were officially sanctioned by the AFL, so you had, to over, you had to overthrow them, the Red Tailors overthrow them, and not just AFL, but the socialist movement is very complicated in New York at that time. The United Hebrew Trades, uh, which is part of this socialist universe, has very close ties to the AFL, and they do not want to endanger those ties. And so when the United Garment Workers and the AFL want the tailors to settle for far less, the, the, the amount of it, far less, um, they side with the, with the AFL, the, the, and so does the forward. You know, part of this universe of cultural socialism is the forward newspaper. You know, you know, you know what that is? It, it, what? It's around the corner. Is it? Yeah. yeah, what, yeah. What, yes. So this was every, every, it was read widely. It was the mass media of the Jewish community. Uh, Kahan, is that how you say his name? I'm not sure. Kahan was a socialist. Everybody's a socialist. Not really, but he was a socialist. But he too had ties to the AFL. And so at a certain point in the mass strike of 1913, the tailors smash the windows of the forward because the forward wants them to settle as the AFL wants them to say, so this is, a str this is quite a struggle to win this out and to win it out with those constitutional principles because that's the vision which supplies the energy. And what you form out of that is what I would call the pre-CIO, meaning it is a independent union, it's an industrial union, right? There's, there's no credit, there, there are locals within it that have craft representation, but it's an industrial union, it's an independent union, and it's a multicultural union. At one point or another, the Amalgamated probably published 12 or more foreign language newspapers, easily, maybe, maybe more than that. So this is a multicultural working class. The notion I just drove me crazy. I saw this editorial some time ago. Uh, it was actually a thing which I, I should have liked in some way in the New Republic which talked about how until now the working class has always been strictly male and strictly white. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's such a profound kind of smug ignorance. Uh, it just drives me nuts. Anyway, this was a multicultural um, union. Uh, and, um, and uh, okay. And um, the, so my argument is that no socialism, no union. And that is abetted, that is enhanced by the existence of a kind of wider radical universe in the city, not in the union per se. First of all, it is in the union. There's the, there's the socialist party as a political instrument. There are socialist assemblymen, there are socialist congressmen from New York City, there are judges from New York City, there are assemblymen from the socialist party in New York City. Imagine that. It produces the kind of uh, cultural confidence, political confidence um, that can help union, and they do. They all are involved in aiding, in aiding the, the strike. And many of those people, most of them, all of them, men, belonged to the unions. They're, they actually, they were workers. There's even a judge who belongs to, uh, Judge Pankin, Jacob Pankin. He was, he's belongs to one of the amalgamated locals. Um, so they're in the union and they're in politics 
and, and, um, and so on. And you also have in the city a kind of socialist awakening among Afro-Americans, among black Americans. And I don't know if you read any of the excerpts from uh, Hubert Harrison, that, well, anyway, um, this, is a, this is critical because uh, Harrison is very critical of the hidebound here and there, and especially in the South, inability or unwillingness of the Socialist Party then to address um, uh, the race question. And he's, he's often thought of as, the, as the, the godfather of the Harlem Renaissance, and he's a socialist for a while, and he's very committed to the class struggle and, and to promoting the class struggle and the, and the struggle against racism. He, 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 as those excerpts, if you read them, suggest he evolves, and he evolves away from socialism because in part of the failure of the Socialist Party then and there to address fully the race question, and he becomes increasingly uh, a nationalist, a Garveyite. He eventually does become a Garveyite. Um, but I'm, I'm, my point here is only that this is part of this larger, uh, this larger, um, you know, nurturing of a, a radical environment. Um, and then, of course, there's the village, um, uh, which uh, is the village radicals. And and what's really interesting to me, you you know these people, right? I mean, there's the well-known artist. You know, did you look at the masses at all? I don't know if you guys looked at the masses, and maybe we can talk about that. Um, there's a kind of anti-bourgeois insouciance, humor, uh, a kind of assault on the whole bourgeois way of life. It's caution, it's orderliness, it's prudential, it's lack of spontaneity, it's patriarchy, it's sexual orthodoxy. All of it is under the scrutiny of these village radicals. Okay, so what? You know what? The middle class, our modern middle class, takes all of that for granted today. Mm -hmm. you know, the difference, one difference is that they were utterly immersed in this working class world. That, they were not. They were not working class. These, this is, to me, a symptom. There are actually a lot of them provincial, like John Reed, uh, who, who comes from Oregon, a very wealthy family. And, and a lot of them come from small towns or s s smaller cities. They are mainly washed. They are well-educated. They have very promising careers ahead of them. Uh, it's, it, it, I used to think of this, well, I won't get into that. I think of this as a failure of an older ruling class to reproduce itself uh, to some degree. These, are, these people should have been part of, uh, 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 certainly Reed should have been, you know, his father's quite well, anyway, who cares about Reed? The, the point is, uh, it's, it's this general kind of assault on, and a romance and a real commitment to the working, a romance insofar is as the working class can be envisioned. Reed did envision it. He would go and report about Pancho Villa down in Mexico and other kinds of movements like that. There's a romance. Why not? This is, uh, uh, there's, they, they're outre. They're, they're bandits. They're outside. They are outside. And they're appreciated for that. And of course, they command, and the village, this village world of radicals, you know, I don't have to name the names, get very involved in aiding these strikes. And the, the most famous, probably, example of that, which I gave you that little script to read about, is the Patterson uh, pageant, uh, where that they will read as the principal organizer of that. It's to help the strikers. The strikers actually act out the drama of the strike. That's a heavily IWW influence strike. Haywood is part of, Bill, Bill, Bill Haywood is part of helping to organize the uh, pageant. Um, and, um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's, that's the difference. Now, a lot of those older bourgeois values are disrespected, dissed by a large section of the middle class that we live with today. But that was not the case then. And w we can either think of them as the ancestors, I would rather not, of, <laughs> of the middle class today. But the big difference was where they were rooted. But there's limits to radicalism. And the limits, and not only, it, 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 there's, 
two things. You have this radical world and, uh, and full of its, its archaicisms and that's revolting and resisting and building institutions and it's marvelous. It's extraordinary. Um, the other part of society that is most profoundly affected by this is what will become a new ruling class. And that is the liberal community, a newly emerging, newly self-conscious liberal community. And they are, they are in the strikes, right? We know about them. Annalise Orlick talks about them. This, they are, they are, some of them are quite well off. Uh, they come from elite backgrounds. Um, they aid the strike. Uh, they raise money for the strike. They appear on picket lines. They get arrested. We're talking not only about social register people, but the Women's Trade Union League, uh, Lillian Hellman, the whole social work world. Um, they get involved uh, in the strike and aiding it in many vital ways, in both strikes, all the strikes. Um, the argument I want to make here is that New York is the cockpit for the birthing of New Deal liberalism in this era, in, in this era, a, a, a way that for liberalism, modern liberalism, is born, in my view, as a response to the labor question. There's many other issues, but in the end, liberals see a highly fractious, explosive, they can see it in New York and they see it all over the place, society, and that uh, needs to be dealt with differently than it had been in the past. That is to say, at the point of a bayonet and other forms of oppression and, and repression. And so uh, they do various things. They create institutions. Annalise mentions the Protocols of Peace, which Hillman actually chairs at a certain point, even though he didn't come out of the ILG. The Protocols of Peace are a way of establishing uh, the framework of industrial democracy in the industry. Gre there'll be, there'll be, there'll be, grievances will be arbitrated, assessed, judged, dealt with fairly impartial judgments will be made. The, the Protocols of Peace fell apart, but the point is, is not that it fell apart, it's, it's what the intention was, to bring stability back into a workplace which would become increasingly un, un, uncontrollable um, and, um, and reform legislation. Obviously, Triangle has a, the fire has a big, a lot to do with this, but there are, long before Triangle, liberals are looking for ways and passing laws and having the Supreme Court overrule them to abolish child labor or to establish a workman's compensation or uh, to provide uh, various kinds of safety measures as Triangle will uh, do. And this is happening in New York City and in New York State as well as elsewhere in the country. Reform legislation that tries to civilize capitalism because it's become so brutish that it's, 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 it's kind of losing its traction. And it, it, it invents, industrial democracy is a very capacious term. Syndicalists are industrial democrats, socialists are industrial democrats, but industrial democracy in the eyes of, of this newly emerging self-conscious liberal community is a form of management. That's what it is. It's a form of management which can use unions and supports unions. It's not, this is not bullshit. This is not rhetoric. These people do support unions because the unions can introduce an element of stability into these workplaces. Indeed, the amalgamated, and I think also the ILG, to some degree, becomes the stabilizing influence in a hyper-competitive industry. One reason the garment industry is always in turmoil is because the margins are so thin. Everybody's undercutting everybody else. You can't get anybody to agree on anything. The union, by take, trying to take labor out of the market, and, and the, the, the industry leaders like Hartshafter and Marx, or, 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 or uh, um, uh, why am I blanking? It doesn't matter. I mean, not, I don't even mean anything to me. Big manufacturers look to the union to establish this kind of stability. Um, Hillman becomes known, celebrated, that's what Bessie was talking about, as a labor statesman, meaning he could defend the interests of his workers up to a point, not to this point, not to that labor will rule point, 
which the union is established on, but indeed improved tremendously and becomes the godfather of, not the godfather, he's the creator, the union becomes the creator of what we now call, and this is also prolegomena to the CIO, social unionism. They begin to campaign for and establish unemployment insurance, uh, uh, health care, uh, various other, and, they became, and it's called, then it's called the new unionism, a unionism which escapes the boundaries of the narrowest forms of collective bargaining. Um, and, and so um, it's a kind of social unionism that goes so far. Just look, what's happening here is democracy from below is pushing elites to make democratic reforms. And they are real reforms. They are really happening and they matter. Um, but it's a question of yes, that far, no further. And, and, um, and then of course, it all comes to an end in the great uh, post-war uh, repression. Um, and you guys all know about uh, the Palmer raids and so on, um, Buddha's wagon, Buddha, uh, uh, I think, well, nobody proves it, but it looks pretty likely. He was an Italian anarchist, had been a Galliani. He was head of the Italian guy for a long time. Uh, you know, blows up the wagon, uh, where the wagon explodes in front of 23 Wall Street, the home of the House of Morgan, the, the, the centerpiece of global capitalism by that point. Um, and... Um, and, uh, and uh, even before that, Palmer uh, has, of course, been conducting his raids, deporting people uh, uh, who uh, deporting all kinds of uh, foreigners, uh, radicals. Uh, so Emma Goldman gets, anyway, a lot of people are deported. Berkman gets deported. The point is, it's the end of an era, a certain kind of era of, of, socialist unionism. Not quite the end. If I was here for another class someday, I would talk about the New Deal, but, but it, 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 because that's a part of this. But, um, but uh, the end of an era, and the village radicals climb to the top of Washington Square's arch and declare, but it won't work, the free and independent republic of Greenwich Village <laughs> amidst all this radicalism. But, the, of course... It doesn't last. And I don't know if you watch the film uh, uh, about the bombing of Wall Street. People don't watch films. I always I, I know in the summer people didn't watch the film. I wonder why. Anyway, if you didn't watch it, I have nothing to say about it. Did anybody watch it? Yeah. Oh, you did. Great. Good. Well, you Here's what I'm going to say. Did you like it? Yeah, it was good. I yeah. Think it's, it's the American experience, right? I think it's very, it's a little more conservative in its approach that I would have liked, but I think it was very informative. Yeah. Story. You want to say anything? Oh, what? Say what? I said I, I like your uh, appearance. My appearance, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I was trying to get out of you. It's like, it's like pulling teeth. I, I like it. It's very polished and very well done and very good in many respects. But what is I don't like about it, or and, and this was the same thing uh, for those of you who are here in the summer, which I said about the Debs film. The problem is. I'm, I'm anti-terrorist. I'm against terrorism. I have been my whole life, and I think it's a kind of position of moral as well as strategic bankruptcy, political bankruptcy. Nonetheless, what the film lacks is the prehistory from the other side of, from the other shore. When, for 30 or 40 years, you see, the film takes this position. We have to respect law and order and civil liberties, and the, and the Palmer raids violated them. They, they stepped across, over that boundary. As long as we respect that boundary, then we're cool, and we, you know, we're, uh, and we don't arrest people who shouldn't be arrested, and we do arrest people who should be arrested, and, and we put them away, and, and so on. And that's a, a kind of liberal conceit. But the reality it, underneath the hidden, not so hidden, the, 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 the bloody reality is that for 30 and 40 years, the way industrial capitalism enforced its rule was by systematic transgression of that rule, 
by violence all over the place, by federal troops, by state troops, by private uh, armies uh, run, owned by, uh, employed by corporations. This is, this is why worker brigades in New York and elsewhere will march through the, city, through the streets of cities in um, the Gilded Age armed. And they're armed because they vow that if they're attacked again, they will fight back. And the armories that we know in the city here, and they were built elsewhere as well, Chicago and other places, were built to stop with, you know, Gatling guns. You know, there were Gatling guns and there were every form of there were, uh, Gatling guns. So when people marched down Park Avenue, because that's where one of the armories is and was and had, was an, a real armory. It wasn't a place to get entertained. And it was manned by the offspring of, the, of Silk Stocking New York. That's the young men. That's who manned it. Um, they, would, uh, they were prepared to shoot and kill. And they did. Uh, not particularly from that armory, but they, 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 they did. And so the, the, the film fails to note that the reign of peace, of civil liberties, of the respect for law and order never existed for working class people in Gilded Age New York and is one of the reasons why people are... Now, they, there were ideological reasons that some anarchists believed in terrorism and propaganda of the deed, but there are other reasons why people are driven to that uh, recourse uh, when... Uh, they have faced uh, chronic violence from the other side that's allowed, permitted, uh, in fact, sanctioned by injunctions uh, by the federal government or state governors. Okay, I've finished. I'm done. Uh, what I said. Yeah. Uh, Um, and just a word of like community agreements is, you know, we're all here to learn and we want to be respectful of other people's perspectives. We're a multi-tenancy organization. Um, and um, that's sad. I think we want to be respectful towards one another um, and feel free to throw questions at Steve. Well, comments, right, yeah. Oh, I just wondered, could you just uh, say a little bit more about, you said there was kind of this emergent ruling class Class. Yeah, and then after the war, it sounds like they were defeated, so to speak, in terms of their approach to the labor yeah. movements. And just like, why? What like? The, 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 and do, do you see them as eventually emerging as kind of hegemonic at a later period? Right. Was, was it an inner class, intra class struggle? Yes, definitely. And that that struggle do doesn't happen. Uh, uh, I mean, the people we're talking about are, you know, Walter Weil from the New Republic, uh, Felix Frankfurter, Louis Brandeis. Uh, these are people who, early in the progressive era, are dealing with the labor question and trying to figure out ways uh, to solve it. Uh, Ellen Starr, uh, Lillian Wald, uh, Jane Addams, um, uh, certain progressive-minded businessmen, the Filene brothers, Elements of the Taylor Society, believe it or not, uh, Morris Cook, who be they become functionaries in the New Deal later on. Uh, these are management, you know, management consultants who are thinking about this. They're friends with Hillman and other elements of the labor movement. They're already establishing those relations right during this period that we've been talking about. But right, it's an Indian summer for the old ruling class. Once that repression happens, you know, the film makes the good point that after the bombing, Morgan was determined, or Morgan Jr., JP is dead, his son runs the bank, is to open right away that uh, to show that they're unfazed by this, while the rest of the country goes crazy. And you can imagine, they're stringing up everybody in sight, uh, 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 people are saying, you know, ship these people to, you know, in, in, in boats of lead to, uh, you know, they're, I mean, you're, you're being arrested for saying Lenin was smart or I mean, everything. It's crazy. Um, uh, they're not scared, the Wall Street people, because they've come out of the war at the top of the global economy. 
They run things. Europe is now deeply in debt to the Wall Street banks. They, they, they have a sense that this, as I think I'm quoting myself, this is not a reveille for radicals, but, the, but, but a kind of a, a end game for that, that moment. So the, you, and then, of course, you have the great boom, uh, the prosperous years, the Wall Street mania of the 20s, uh, so that the questions are not opened up again. Um, and it partly, you know, that happens because the United States is hegemonic in the world capitalist economy. It also happens because there are, there are really burgeoning new important industries, generating employment, uh, opening up vast new stretches of the consumer economy. Um, so, the, and then the Depression, and that reopens all these questions, and, and, and even more fiercely because the system seems in a terminal crisis, and after the initial shock of the Great Depression, workers and all kinds of people are resisting in a variety of ways. The country is again in a tumultuous state, and I would argue that it, it retains some of that anti-capitalist culture that I, I believe infused what was going on in New York City 20 years earlier. I don't know if that's that. And then, then they have an all-out war. Then it's a, a war against the Wall Street banks, the heavy industrialists, uh, um, uh, Ford, uh, you know, uh, especially those who are in the primary goods producing parts of the industry, coal, iron, steel, resist. Uh, they are the ones who form the American Liberty League to go after Roosevelt. Uh, you know, this is, I don't know, I'm talking maybe too uh, cryptically here, but they, 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 there's an organized resistance to Roosevelt on the part of certain segments, major segments of the business community, other segments of the business community are friendlier to Roosevelt, those more oriented to, to a mass distribution. Part of, part of what this new ruling class is talking about is a new economy, a real, and they want high wages. They want a high wage, which is after all part of the rationale for the Wagner Act, uh, to generate uh, a level of wages that can support a mass consumption economy. And they're talking about that long before there's a Wagner Act. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, I'm going on too much. Uh, and somebody else. Yeah. yeah um, you had laid out a wonderful, fascinating history of the time. Um, I, I, kudos. Um, I just, in the time we have, you can't cover every single thing. But yeah. I just wanted to fill in a couple of Yeah, a couple of, sure. Um, you mentioned the 1877 Railway strike. Yeah. And in 1894, there was Eugene Debs right. forming, becoming the president of the American Railway Union, and leading the strike back then. And then, of course, later on, <laughs> a couple of decades later, a hundred years before Bernie Sanders, he ran for president and did it while he was in prison. And right. if you believe in democracy. Right. That's kind of why I don't want to kick Trump off the ballot, even as much as I'd like. It. <laughs> so anyway, I don't want to I, yeah. digress again, but but. Um, yeah, but I mean, he got a million votes while in pr almost a million votes while in prison, um, and out of wait, that was a lot of votes back then. It was like out of twelve million or something, whatever the figure was back then. And this is like I said, a hundred years before Bernie Sanders, the pre precursor. So it's just some fascinating history there. Yeah, absolutely, and, and uh, you're right. And, and uh, I didn't mention these things because they don't happen in New York, and I felt constrained by my my brief as uh, talking about. Red New York, but but you're right, and, and it, it's kind of artificial to separate New York from elsewhere because the country in general is in that state, uh, especially in its big industrial centers during that period. And the Debs and the Pullman and the, the Homestead Strike; these are all indications of of that uproar that's going on. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to maybe get you to talk a bit more about those constraints. Focusing on New York, I feel like um, something about um, our specificity is a little underwhelming <laughs> compared to some other centers in America, America and elsewhere in the world. Like, um, if you consider Paris, for instance, similar levels of sort of small, for most of its history, small shops, you know, artisan labor. But even beyond there, it doesn't really industrialize. Like New York industry was always kind of yes. a bit smaller. But Paris, you have the commune, you have all the stuff. I feel like in New York, where we had a lot of bloodshed, a lot of struggle, 
it doesn't reach that level. And I'm curious, um, what are the constraints you felt when limiting yourself to a New York, New York radical history in this period? Well, that's a tough question. That's about why, you know, this whole American, why America doesn't produce the kind of mass socialist movement that is true in Europe, and there are uh, uh, many reasons for that. We, we, you were here, I think, in the summer. We talked a bit about that in the summer. Um, let me, let me, uh, I don't want to uh, launch into a long, I want to use what you said to make a couple of comments. New York is a city of small batch, what's called by technical people, small batch production. And uh, it lends a certain leverage uh, to, uh, uh, to certain kinds of unions in, in certain situations. But it, it's also, the, the thing that I think strikes me about uh, Paris, the Commune, and New York, even though New York does not quite achieve <laughs> that level, is that they're both... New York is a very democratic city. It really is. And part of that is due, I mean, everything's relative, but it is. And part of that is due, I think, to its petty bourgeois character. And uh, I think that's true of Paris as well. And so, although the commune, I don't, I by no means an expert on the commune, but what adds to the power of kind of radicalism. It's greeted in New York. It's welcomed in New York by a petty bourgeoisie as well as a working class and an immigrant milieu and with all of its uh, baggage uh, because it is antipathetic in many ways to big capital, wants reform, um, and values its cosmopolitanism. I read a, a book, I don't know, you guys, some of you will know what this is. It's a terrific book. Um, um, it's called The City Game. And it's about, uh, of all things, the great City College basketball scandal. Do you even know what that is? In, yeah, 1950. It's a terrific book. And it paints a picture, this is 1950, when New York is still like this. Uh, that team... It won, it's the only team ever in history to win both national championships. Now you, of course, the NIT, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Anyway, they win. it's historic, 1950. That team is made up of nine Jews and four Caribbeans. It's unbelievable. And that's, that's New York. And it's because City College, the Harvard of the proletariat, which is what it was known as, is this kind of... Um, bastion of pride for working class, immigrant, petty bourgeois, New York. And it's why it, I think part of the reason it can inculcate this kind of culture. I can't answer Paris versus America or New York. Uh, the constraints that New York presents are not New York constraints. They are the American constraints of why uh, there isn't that scale of, uh, but looking back, look at, look at it, look at it. I mean, look at this. That's extraordinary. That unions, mass unions, these are thousands of people are subscribing, joining, fighting, picketing for a union that says labor will rule. A union and the, 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 the question for us is, and it's been debated by radicals and other people a long time, is what, to go back to what I said at the beginning, what is the relationship, let's put it in the most antiseptic way, between collective bargaining and revolution, socialist revolution? What is the relationship? It's not so clear. It's, it's, it's uh, complicated. And I think what I was trying to say, I mean, we're all, obviously, we go out, we support the UAW. Of course we do. Why wouldn't we? Um, but what is, what is the, where is that headed? What's headed? Are we, I, as, as Carrington knows, I just wrote an article. Um, she has not read, but uh, it's just terrible of her. Mm -hmm. um, but it's called, not, it's not called what it was called before uh, Jacobin published it, The Politics of Restoration. And it argues that 
the left to some degree and the right, obviously the right, are plagued today by a kind of politics of restoration. And for the left, that means the New Deal. That becomes the far horizon. Socialist abstractions notwithstanding, the practical life and uh, world and uh, aspirations of much of the left is to restore the New Deal. Why not? It was a hell of a lot better than what we have now. So it's completely understandable, but it's not this. Yeah. Uh, behind you. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. no, I meant the woman. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I missed. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No union without socialism, kind of vibe, like inverting it. But uh, I was wondering if you go into kind of more the particular, like relationship that the amalgamated had with the socialist party at the time, really, and what the nature of that relationship was, as well as the the more precise relationship between, like the amalgamated leaders and the workers with the Bill of Rights. Yeah. Well, Hillman, of course, is a Bundist. He's a, he identifies with the socialist movement for a long time until we get to the middle of the New Deal years. He's vitally dependent on the socialist cadre in the union. There's, there's, there are officials in the union, like in any union, the appointed, you know, stewards and, and, and uh, chapter chairs and the normal hierarchy, but he doesn't rely on them. Oh, he, he, I mean, they, they function, they function. But what he relies on is something called the activity. The activity holds no official union post. They are the radicals. They're the socialists um, who he knows he can trust uh, and rely on their commitment is a hundred percent. Uh, and, uh, they follow his lead. And these are largely socialists, both Jewish and the Italian socialists, August Polanka, other people in the union are, uh, are part of this activity and key to the way Hillman, uh, administers, manages. And, and remember the union is in a state of permanent because of the nature of the industry organizing. Because the industry is always disorganizing, chronically. It never is stable. So, you know, a, 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 a shop that's a, a union today is open tomorrow. A, a city, you know, there are garment, the garment industry is all over the place. It's in Baltimore and Boston, Montreal, Chicago, every place, Philadelphia. They're organizing everywhere. And some of these cities are constantly escaping the grasp of the union. All of them do when the depression, not all of many of them do when the depression hits in 1930. So he needs this activity to be, it's almost like, you know, the old flying squadron of the UAW strike. They're not quite like that, but they're, they're on the job all the time uh, doing that. When it, it, we get to the New Deal era, Hillman's relationship to the socialist movement becomes more, oh, I should say, there's also communists in the union quite active, and unlike the ILG, which is very anti-communist, Hillman is much shrewder and is it does not take that line. He may oppose them in some instances, not in other instances, because they are very good organizers, extremely good. And so that when we get to the 1930s, and remember, he's been in a battle against the UHT, the United Hebrew Trades, Kahan, some of the socialist politicians to establish his union. When we get to the 1930s, he's willing to deal uh, with the Communist Party, which then is a real force in New York City, particularly, but everywhere. It's a real force. He's ready to deal with them, and he's ready to deal with them in the ALP, in the American Labor Party. And the Socialist Party, one obviously nothing to do with that. Um, so, uh, you know, he, he he's... He's a very shrewd, adaptable uh, tactician and strategist. He's appreciated for that, both by liberals who, you know, he's the key liaison between the labor movement and Roosevelt and the New Deal. Not Lewis, because Lewis is often at odds and has his own stuff going on and was a Republican and all of that and becomes a Republican again. Um, it's Hillman who they strategize with. 
whether it's about the Fair Labor Standards Act in the 30s or, or the purge of the party in the 30s, you know, the attempt to purge the party and so on. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this very interesting and inspiring and complicated history, are there, do you see there, are there lessons for us to put into practice to prevent the election of a fascist president? No, I don't know. <laughs> I know everything except that. No, I, 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 yeah, I, I don't, I don't yeah. wish I could say yeah. something. I, you know, this essay, I, I try to advertise it, is a, is a kind of open-ended thing which struggles to say, how do we get out of this cul-de-sac of politics of restoration? Because I think we need to in order to address that question. I really do. Um, I think we need to get some version of no socialism, no union. Uh, I don't know how to do that. But I know that the energies, the inspiration, the emotionality, uh, all of these things which are maybe are tactile but not as material and tangible as we sometimes grow accustomed to thinking about the left being involved with need to be reinserted back into the movement. Yeah, I forget, somebody raised their hand here. Yes, yeah. Um, I was surprised to see um, in the article about pageant, Samuel Gompard's name mentioned. Yes. Who I always thought was like very much against the IWW and all this, this radical nonsense. Um, so yeah, how, how much working together was there? Between? Very little. But he does he does show up there, but he is very anti the IWW, uh, and uh, and uh, and anti socialist for that matter. You know, he only in until John Sweeney was elected in what year? Nineteen ninety five. When was it? Ninety something like that. Until John Sweeney was elected president, there had never ever been an incumbent thrown out of office except in one year when the socialist man, I think it's 1894, um, to uh, oust Gompers briefly. Uh, he hated the socialists. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. This may piggyback to what you were saying before. I don't know if this is off date, but I know uh, I went to Patterson recently and I was reading up on the Italian anarchists there who were working in the silk industry yeah. and how they were anarchists. So they didn't, um, I guess there was maybe some opposition to the communist sort of approach, which was, right, all the money of the, from their labor goes presumably to the state while the anarchist approach was a collective. And they, yeah. so, and I was just wondering if you had, I don't know if it a position on that or just what, well, there are no communists then, but they 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 are they are anti-political and anti-government uh, by ideology, by ideological the anarchists, ideological inclination. That's 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 right, and uh, so they, right they take that position there, and, and there are they, there are a lot of anarchists in Patterson, a lot of syndicalists um, um, there, but there are there's no communist party then. The communist party only gets born after the Palmer raids in 1919. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I've heard a lot of arguments of people on the left saying, you know, for a long time, socialists in America, they wanted to keep going back to these tactics and strategies that were used during the Russian Revolution. And then it's, they were saying, you know, we can't do that. It's, it's got to evolve. But do you feel like to get to that point of, you have thousands of people who are, you know, socialists and they're involved in these unions and you have this, you know, um, communist party that's a real force. So do you think for us to get to that in contemporary times, there's strategies and tactics we could pull from back then that would work now? I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's almost the same. I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> oh, well, just to, like maybe a way to think about that is what, when you're as a historian, I imagine you imagine these times and probably put yourself in them. Yeah. What do you think it was about the experience of work, like kind of the micro level, mm -hmm. that gave rise to that kind of consciousness? Well, so many, so many, so many things. Uh, it, it, people, people who had been uh, craftsmen, say, in various uh, ways, lost uh, craftsmen both in small shops and within factories where they could practice their specialized tasks. 
suffered the loss of that, not only control over what they were doing and who could tell them what to do, but a sense of themselves, that this was, in gen this was part of their identity, who they were. They were being proletarianized. And the shock of that, um, in my opinion, produced this kind of existential crisis and rage and outrage. You know, it's important to move from rage to outrage, because outrage is a moral position. And I think the shock of proletarianization did that to these people. It did it to Italian peasants who came to America to work, often return, about half of them returned to Italy. And they came because they wanted to hold on to their small holdings in Italy. They still thought of themselves as small holders, uh, tenant farmers, maybe, whatever they were. Uh, that was not, and they were being wiped out by the latifundia of, uh, in Sicily and elsewhere. Um, and they, they want to retain that, and they can't. And they're treated like stuka, like animals, like beasts in these various uh, factories. And it's, it's, it's shocking. And so uh, the rage and the moral outrage, uh, or the outrage, happens for these people. It happens... Um, the problem is that we take for granted today what they did not. We take for granted wage labor. That is the way things are and have been for a very long time. They did not take for granted. They wanted jobs, they wanted to earn money and so on, but they, when they experienced that way of life, it shocked them in all of its manifold ways. Uh, the tyranny exercised uh, uh, by the boss, the, the profound sense of disrespect. Um, that we people feel some of that today, but they take wage labor as a given. Um, how you get from accepting something as a given? I mean, look, the fact look until uh, DSA, Bernie Sanders, Occupy Wall Street, nobody had voiced nobody in any large numbers. I mean, anti-capitalist sentiment as a public emotion for fifty years. So I'm not saying. We can't get there. Things are happening and have happened over the last recent 10, 15 years, whatever exactly it is. Um, and, um, and it may be that some of what is going on now, the production, the precariousness of work, for example, uh, may engender that same kind of uh, um, thing, the subcontracting out of work, uh, the, the um, but I don't know, you know, I, I don't know. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, you kind of talk about like the Greenwich Village radicals and a lot of them being kind of from provincial wealth. Yeah, uh, some of them were, yeah. And not necessarily with working class vibe. And if there were uh, particular tensions in that uh, between like them and like the working class, like the organizations like the Amalgamated slash like I mean, kind of jumping off that, like a magazine like The Masses, would you say that, that the people who wrote that, were they primarily from that milieu or from where you're Yeah, they're milieu? primarily from that milieu, they... mainly, not uh -huh. always. Some of them do come from proletarian backgrounds, but mainly they're from that milieu. I'm sure there were tensions. Uh, there could not, not have been, I don't see how. But the, the difference then was their complete immersion and romanticization of this um, this uh, world of the socially outcast. You know, we think of, of, of we, when we use the word today, outcast or marginalia, uh, we have a fairly narrow definition today, although it's broadening <laughs> with the advent of modern, whatever you call it, capitalism. The margins are getting wider. But for a long time, we thought of them as, you know, the abject poor, you know, the homeless, whatever, whatever it is. Okay. The more the outcast then is this huge proletarian mass, which is disrespected by official society in the main and treated that way. And the commitment of these people, because they too felt cast out or voluntarily exiled from or exiled themselves from this bourgeois world, 
an affinity um, uh, for 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 this working class, which I think um, was was acknowledged by whether it's by Hillman or other people in the uh, in the in the in the trade union movement in the left wing of the trade union movement at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know I'm sure there was action. I think for the most part, people were happy to see an issue of the masses. Or, you know, this is our paper. You know, they were happy about it for the most part, and happy that you know that there was a, a, a spokesman. Uh, a magazine that said more or less their point of view. So though there was tensions, I think overwhelmingly they were happy to see these kinds of things and supported it. Yeah, I think that's right. And and the, I mean, it's. It, I hope <clears throat> you enjoyed, even if you just scan the masses, it's quite a remarkable publication. It's wit uh, it, it is, is exciting. Um, you have this sense that they're inventing the new, and uh, they're, be, they're, they're craftsmen of a new world. They want to be, and they're doing it. And so too of the drawings and the illustrations and the fiction. And, and of course, they're also uh, vitally anti-imperial. Uh, you probably read Reed's uh, speech just on the eve of America joining the war. Um, uh, and they see that. It's not a separate issue. It's part of this global picture of revolution against capitalism, which is not so much the way it's seen today. We don't deal with it. We some do, and some don't. Well, that, yeah. that was like a huge piece of the uh, Dems platform, right? When he was of what? Was, I'm sorry. Of Eugene Dems' yeah, platform, yeah, right? absolutely. With anti-imperialism and this yeah, kind of yeah, <laughs> yeah. One of the reasons I didn't like that film on Dems was right. it downplays that. Right. It it downplays. You don't like it. Dev's welcoming of the Bolshevik Revolution. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but several times in the speech, he said, yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I guess I, I was really interested in the part where you're talking about, you know, these are immigrant communities with a lot of like solidarity. Yeah. And that was a big resource to draw on. Yeah. But I, I just wanted to hear more about the tensions, because obviously there's a lot of conflict between there different is a lot of groups. Conflict, yeah. and, and, uh, there are nationality conflicts. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and all kinds of, and, and so it's both a resource to draw on and like an obstacle. Yeah, and, that's and right. I, I, I mean, it just really resonates, and I just wanted to talk here about that. Yeah, well, that's what makes with the kind of socialist consciousness. Yeah, which well, is that's about what makes the, the uh, as such. Yeah. Right. That that's what makes the choreography of the amalgamated and other unions like it so remarkable because they have to manage all of that. And um, and uh, that's why there are a dozen or more foreign language papers. They, they, that these nationalities have to feel they have a voice in the union, that they can talk uh, about what concerns. They don't only talk about what concerns their particular nationality, but they have that, that they have that voice. They will be represented on the general executive board. Um, there are various ways of trying to incorporate them into the union. It's a problem. In the 30s, uh, the, the amalgamated has to wage a fight within its own ranks against Italian workers who like Mussolini and are fascists. Uh, this is, this is, you know, this is complicated. So this is what you, the world, you're, the real world. Yeah. I'm interested in what you said about um, the rise of liberalism as yeah. kind of a, a way to um, tackle the, the labor question or reaction to the labor question. It seems today liberalism kind of wants to deflect away from the, the labor question. Um, for some reason, it reminded me of the, the Roosevelt Island with the four freedoms, you know, uh, FDR, right? I yeah. think, yep. you know, if one, of them, one of them being freedom from poverty, which is kind of rich, you know, yeah. being in the middle of New York City. Yeah. But, you know, like today's liberalism kind of looking at, you know, poverty is this like, like this maybe this crime without a criminal. Like there's nothing to see here with regard to capitalism. Um, was there a divergence there? Do you, yeah, there's do you a big divergence. That? The liberal world, which in the 1930s and beyond that, sees poverty 
as a function of the breakdown of the economic system. How the hell else are you going to want to see it? I mean, it's inescapable. You can't blame it on something else. The, you know, no one, literally no one is working for U.S. Steel. No one. <laughs> it's shut. So poverty. But by the time we get to uh, the post-war era, liberalism has begun to redefine, in part in light of the race question, uh, but not only in part about that, what poverty really is. It's not a function of exploitation or the lack of work. It, well, it's not a function of exploitation and depression. It's a function of being unskilled, uneducated, and therefore uh, excluded, marginalized in that way, excluded from the workforce. And 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 there may, and then there's a culture of poverty that is supposed to explain that you know we, we Moynihan's report et cetera so all that kind of thing so you know the, there's a kind of culture is supposed to account for that but it's no longer a capitalist problem it's a cultural problem uh, and 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 uh, and one that's addressed in the 60s by the war on war on poverty um, which never ventures to touch on the root of, of uh, the capitalist economy in generating um, uh, poverty. Uh, so liberalism becomes wedded to that. And part of it is, is, is a function of it becoming newly enlightened about the race question after the civil rights movement compels it to be that way um, so that it becomes uh, conscious of race and poverty and the linkages between them and is in its own way uh, a way of deflecting attention away from capitalism. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop. So uh, thank you very much.